Maybe you've seen those posts on social media that say badly explain your profession. I always comment the same thing. I talk to ghosts. And honestly, it's really not that far off of a description, although there is a little bit more to it than that. And the little bit more part of it has me living in truly some of the most gorgeous places on earth. So I'm talking to you now from Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and here I am just outside of Ulaanbaatar with a friend of mine who's a world-renowned horseback archer and falconer, and he's showing me around his place. Just a few days before, I was here, above the Arctic Circle in Sápmi on the Norway side of the border, way at the top of the Scandinavian Peninsula, a place where I also live sometimes. But this video is not about Mongolia, and it's not about Sápmi. It's about me getting to Mongolia from Sápmi, which has its whole extra layer of challenges for someone like me who talks to ghosts. Come along with me as I travel through airports and through realms, and see the world through my eyes for a moment. I just want to share what it's like <laughs> as someone who trains my energy to be as sensitive as possible so that I can pick up on these more subtle awarenesses slamming me <laughs> into international travel. It's a little bit of a rough transition for me, <laughs> but I made it and I wanted to take you along on uh, the four days that it took for me to get from Sápmi to Mongolia. Here we go. Hi, I'm Francis. For those of you who don't know my story, here's a quick and dirty summary. Eight years ago, I was a clinical psychologist in private practice, happy, smug, and snug in my belief that psychology knew everything we needed to know about the mind and how to live a happy life. So to say I was surprised is one way to say it when I began hearing spirits and seeing energy. Yep, that's what happened. So I left my job and I left my life to learn what I hadn't learned in graduate school, which turns out was quite a bit. I now work with the spirits and train others as well. This channel is to share my journey with you. Thanks for coming along. My journey begins waking up on the fjord where I've been living with my boyfriend for these last couple of months. When we wake up, I'll have a couple hour drive to Tromsø and from Tromsø, there's a quick two hour flight to Oslo. Once at Oslo where I will arrive in the evening, I'll be spending two nights at the airport hotel. I gave myself an extra day there because there'd been a lot of strikes when I was planning this trip and I wanted to make sure I had a little bit of a buffer in case something happened. From Oslo, the next day I'll have a four hour flight to Istanbul, Turkey. And in Istanbul, Turkey, I have a dreaded 20 hour layover in one of the more chaotic airports I've ever been to. <laughs> After the 20 hour layover, it's a decent eight hour flight to finally arrive in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Ulaanbaatar is the capital of Mongolia. Mongolia's total population is just over 3 million with just about precisely half of that population living in the very urban city of Ulaanbaatar. But it is many, many days to go before I get here. So day one, I wake up and say goodbye to this beautiful fjord that I've been living on for the last couple of months. To get to Tromsø, it's a just over two hour drive, which will include two ferry rides. And on these ferries, I get my very last taste for at least a little while of one of my favorites, Svela with brown cheese. To start my journey, I'm feeling great. And if you've had experiences similar to mine, you know just what I mean. If you haven't, then it's just, it's just hard to understand. It's a jungle out there when it comes to energy. And having lived on the fjord for a bit, the energy environment surrounding me was really calm and peaceful and harmonious and healthy, which let the energy I carry really expand out and become very, very sensitive to the environment and people around me. So this is ideal for my job, which is really hard to summarize quickly, but briefly I'll say I work with subtle energies that are around us and within us. So for me to be functioning well, I like to have a huge and healthy, fluffy and bright energetic field. Already as we're starting to drive into Tremsa, the energy is shifting in the environment around me. It's becoming more discordant, less harmonious, and that begins to impact the energy within me. When I'm in an environment for a long time, it's no problem. Almost everywhere I am, I can take care of it, but it's all these quick shifts of energy as I'm traveling that it's hard to describe. I don't know, maybe it's almost like getting the bends. It's just like a constant bombardment of my <laughs> energetic field in a way that makes it slowly over time more and more destabilizing for me. But I have a lot of practice with this, so for today I'm feeling great. I just need to say goodbye to my boyfriend, check in my luggage, and take the quick and easy two-hour flight down to the other part of the Norway neighborhood in Oslo. 
One of the unique things about my life, living in over 200 places in the last some years, is more or less everything I own is in my luggage. I, I'm like a turtle, I take everything with me. That's not entirely true. I have like a mid-season jacket in Greenland, my yoga mat I left in Sápmi, I have some warm weather clothes and some other places that I live, but generally speaking, this is everything, and I need to have this for all the seasons that I travel through. In one sweep around the sun, I can be living in some of the very coldest places on Earth and some of the hottest. Best practices I've developed from traveling is every time I go into a new space, first thing I do is check all the corners and crevices to make sure I'm the only <laughs> material form being in the space around me. After a cozy night's sleep, I get my last taste of the unique food that is Scandinavian food and get some work done. Also squeeze in filming a short reel for my secret Instagram page <laughs> for Mooncake, my travel companion. This day should be pretty smooth for me. Also, it's a pretty small airport compared to some of the airports I travel through. Pretty streamlined process, just getting my luggage checked in and then making my way to the gate. Although, once I'm past security, it becomes a whole different zoo. You'll see what I mean. So checking in my luggage was not a streamlined process. Something that I didn't mention before is actually most of my luggage is not clothing. It's really heavy objects that I use <laughs> for the work that I do. So my luggage is always like just a hair's breadth away from the over limit of what can be checked in and I was over a hair's breadth and I had to do <laughs> a lot of rearranging. It was quite a hassle to get my luggage checked in this time, but all worked out with a little bit of a... <laughs> A little bit of magic. Here's the part I'm dreading. As soon as I cross over here into the international terminal, absolute duty-free nightmare. Oh, sensory overload. Just left, right, and center. There's no escape. There's no escape from this. Bright lights, it's loud music, the smells are everywhere of all the perfumes. This is when it starts. So I have a confession to make. On my flight to Turkey, I booked a business ticket because not for the flights and the seats but with a business ticket you get access to lounges where it's so quiet you get watery potato soup it's a moment in all this chaotic travel for me to put myself together again before I go back out into this and much more importantly than watery potato soup lounge, it means at the other end of this four hour flight when I get to Istanbul, I'm going to have this place of sort of um, relative quiet for that 20 hour dreaded layover. For now, there's nothing for me and my travel companions to do, but just take in this relatively lower sensory input environment to keep myself together. These guys were talking the whole time, louder and louder, the more wine they drink, but that's okay. They were just doing their thing. They weren't obnoxious. It just kind of started to get to me. I let Mooncake swap seats with me so he could look out the window. And I did my best to just kind of keep myself together. I never quite got any sleep on this flight, but I did get just kind of that zone out time. The descent into Istanbul at night was beautiful. It was like landing on stars. One of the things I love about Istanbul Airport, which is admittedly a very short list, is just the sheer diversity of people that come through. In 2021, it had 37 million passengers, making it the busiest airport in Europe. The statistic I find more interesting is that 27 million international passengers crossed through these terminals, which made it the second busiest airport in the world in terms of international passenger traffic. It's just fun to see all these cultures and we're all, we're all doing the same thing. We're all just trying to get to our flights. I don't know, there's just like this real moment of like global mm, connection that I feel mm, and 
in a way that I have felt in few other places. I think maybe because we're all just trying to frantically find our gates in this very poorly marked airport. <laughs> it really reduces the differences between us. By this time, I am dragging. I'm feeling weird inside. My sense of time is completely distorted. I can't wait to get to this highly praised lounge and just find a place to eat and to rest. It is a different world in this lounge. It's spacious, it's quiet. There's sweets everywhere. <laughs> and most importantly, there's just places to lie down every which way I turn. I have truly never seen anything like this in any airport before. And it's open 24 hours, so they have rich people toys. Like, what is, what is this? I thought golf was the rich people toy, and then I saw this. <laughs> it's unreal. There's food. All kinds of foods you can imagine available 24 hours a day. Oh, this yogurt drink was really good. But for all the toys and things to do and see there, I really just, I was so tired. I just wanted some good food in me and to take a rest. These peppers are actually sweet. They're not spicy at all. I'm not gonna say they're worth the trip to Istanbul, but uh, it's a highlight of being there. So by this time, it's probably about 4 a.m. I've hit sensory overload. I'm wearing sunglasses inside just to keep it together. But still, this surreal scene gets an absolute thumbs up from me. Ugh, and finally, rest. I paid so much more than I usually do for a plane ticket just for this moment. A place in this chaos to rest. So imagine my surprise, not 30 minutes later, waking up to basically something like this. This woman from Turkish Airlines saying I'm not allowed to sleep in the lounge. I have a 20 hour layover and they said I'm not allowed to sleep there. I did start to cry a little bit. After some very confusing back and forth, they suggested this as an option. What? They suggested I, I sleep in these sleep pods? I mean, look at these things. I'm no fool. Those things were literally designed for cargo transport. They put you in and they put you in a cargo plane. <laughs> and we're in an international airport that ships things all over the world. You climb into one of those things, you're going to wake up in Tobago. All of these sleeping people were woken up one by one. Thank goodness, in my delirium, I contacted my brother-in-law back in the USA. and He's a very savvy traveler. He found that actually inside the airport, there is a hotel that you can pay for by the hour. And I just, <laughs> while I was not looking forward to spending another penny, I was looking forward to keeping a little bit of my sanity. And so off I went. Unbelievable. So by this time, I am not doing so hot. I may look like I'm just going down an escalator. That's something I clearly know how to do <laughs> without trouble. But it's just the cumulative effect of going through all of these different energetic environments. You know, there are 37 million human passengers going through the Istanbul airport. They aren't counting the probably a couple million more ghosts that have passed through in the year. For each grandma that you may see sitting in a wheelchair, sometimes her spouse who passed a few years ago is sitting right next to her. It's a lot to be taking in for me, and I just need a space of quiet. Oh, thank goodness. This was all just a dream. I'm on the fjord. Ooh, I'm not at the fjord. The colorscape of this hotel is just the palette of a dystopian nightmare. Like, I felt like I was stuck in space and humanity had only myths of trees, but no human had seen them for 3,000 years. Why? Why would you? You could do anything. You could make this a calming oasis environment. No. I feel like I'm in a space capsule. Ugh. But just wait, <laughs> it gets better when I get into the room. What, <laughs> what is this room that I'm renting by the hour? <laughs> Still gotta do my check, any material beings. 
Okay, we're good. <laughs> I don't know if I'm looking for a human or an alien in this place, but all clear. I paid, I think, $15 extra for a window. <laughs> uh, and here's a bed. So you know what? This is going to get the Francis coveted thumbs up. A bed is a bed. With just a few hours left of my 20 hour layover, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I still have access to this lounge as long as I pinky promise swear not to close my eyes. Hi, can I have some of the moussaka with rice? One. Thank you. And what should I see? Just across from my final meal, a man sleeping in the Turkish Airlines lounge. Uh, the thing is, at this point, I'm about here. I've come to think of souls as coming in like 31 different flavors, and I'm the flavor of soul, perhaps you are too, that's just more aware of the fact that we are simultaneously existing in many realms. We all are, but some souls like mine were actually aware of it and were able to move through different realms, we're able to control our consciousness. We have sort of a special skill set. The thing about having this special skill set is souls like mine were just were a lot more sensitive to the environment around us as well. What's happening to me right now is maybe something you've experienced too. I'm so worn down. My soul is just not completely in home in my body. It's sort of flitting around. I don't know how to describe it exactly outside of me. So I see these nuns and I'm, I'm feeling what the nuns are feeling. I go inside the airplane and if I look at someone too long, I'm feeling what they're feeling. Mooncake's chill. He's got a different flavor of soul than me. Ooh, free things. Who doesn't like free toothpaste? So I'm sharing this with you. I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm certainly not complaining. I've decided to be very open about my journey because I've come to recognize that there are people like me in all cultures throughout the world. And many cultures that have kept their wisdom traditions intact understand that souls like mine have gifts to share. It's only these more modern cultures that have begun to tell us that people like me are sick and we're not sick. The environment is sick and we need to learn how to take care of ourselves to navigate through these difficult energy environments. As run down and sensitive as I am feeling at this point, all I need is a couple hours alone in a room in a quiet environment and I can put myself right back together. The reason why I'm being so public about this, and I have people tell me you're not supposed to be talking about these things publicly, but in the vacuum that has been created, people like me who aren't sick we have these experiences happen to me and we have no idea what's going on and we live in these cultures where when we try to find answers, the only answers we can find are stories and myths telling us that we're sick. We believe these myths and then we become sick. We're not sick. There's nothing wrong with us. It's the cultures that have become distorted. I very purposefully choose to be very public and open about my experiences because my dream is to be part of a movement creating more space for all of us, for all the beautiful diversity that there is in ways of being. You don't need to have had experiences of consciousness like mine to have had experiences looking at the larger dominant culture that you may find yourself in and not seeing how you fit in. But it's not you, it's these cultures that carry the problems. Us, we are the remedy, we are the medicine.
sometimes it's just the smallest things that are almost invisible for the many that mean everything to the few. To know the current prayer location means nothing to me, but for some on this plane, it means everything. Completely transforming these cultures that we live in may take nothing more than something small that you're able to do this very day. For this day, it doesn't feel like there's much I can do other than try to keep my soul from escaping my right eye. Mooncake chills. When I left Mongolia just almost exactly three years ago, I left with the intention of coming back just a few short months later, but of course, COVID changed everything for almost all of us. When I left, I left a piece of my heart here. And as I return, I'm not returning to collect my heart. I'm returning to bury more of my heart in this land. Some people not from Mongolia find aspects of life here much more chaotic, whereas I find myself much more comfortable in how everything flows here. You just got to be able to let go to flow here. For me, it's much more aligning with how things really are. And in a lot of ways, having come from the Nordic zones, I'm looking forward to the flow of Mongolia as an elixir for the, like the over-rigidity and adherence to the manufactured time that has become part of the experience for me of moving through Nordic-influenced cultures. Not being from the culture, I'd say everything works here, but never in the way you expect it to. <laughs> Mongolia as a country carries the two extremes of having most of the land being some of the lowest human population density you'll find in the entire world, yet the capital is very high population density. In my mind, I, I always hear the word land of Priuses when I arrive to the capital. You'll never guess why. <laughs> it's the Priuses. <laughs> Despite my excitement, I am still just not totally inside my body home where I should be. Finally, after four days of travel, I have arrived to where I will be for several months. It is indescribable the elation 
to be alone in this space. And it really does just take a couple of hours alone within a space quiet where I just can put myself right back together again. Humpty Dumpty's wildest dreams. And I'm here. I made it. We made it. I can't wait to share what's going to be coming up. I have so many plans. Let's see how much I can get documented for us all. We are in Mongolia, folks. This is happening. Like this video? Consider liking and subscribing so we can stay connected.